Hey everybody, Chris and Becky Grandel are gonna share their story with you today. Their story is actually very fascinating because Chris grew up with a disability before accessibility laws here in the United States, and he was able to explain exactly what it was like pre-ADA and post-ADA, and it's super interesting. Um, they both are very good storytellers, so you are in for a treat. Thanks for listening to their story, and enjoy. All right, I'm Chris Grandel and I'm 63, and I'm an engineer for Northrop Grumman in Charlottesville, Virginia. Cool. I am Becky Grandall, I'm 61 years old, and I am a shipping and receiving person at Objective Industries in Fishersville. All right, and where do you guys live? In Stewart Strath, Virginia. Awesome, good place. Um, we so, think so. <laughs> we think so. You think yeah. so? Good, <laughs> good. Um, so tell me some basic details about your disability, how long you've lived with it. Okay. Uh, I was born with a condition known as spina bifida. And uh, very simply what it means is that uh, as the fetus develops in the first eight weeks, uh, the neural tube that defines the spine opens up or breaks and the spinal cord doesn't develop properly at that breaking point. In my particular case, it's called myelomeningocele, which means when I was born, the spinal cord was exposed to the open air, the drained spinal fluid, and I was born paralyzed from the waist down. So uh, I've used braces and crutches all my life since then, and now somewhat mostly a wheelchair and the other accoutrements that go with it. So. Sure, yeah. And so at a young age, I mean, did you have, I guess you had surgeries when you were younger? or? Yeah, not as many as some spina bifidas have. I had uh, one major surgery at the time when I was young. They didn't have the skin grafting techniques that they have now. And so they couldn't close that opening in the spine very well. Mm -hmm. So I was 18 months old wow. uh, when they closed the spine. And most spina bifidas, there was like a 5% chance of survival at that severity of spina bifida because of the incidence of infection with an open wound. Sure, so that was what, 1950s? 1950, the spine was closed, but my spine was closed in like 56, just about 56, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I was born in 54, right, that's correct. Okay. And so, yeah, so I had a surgery for that, and then uh, no more surgeries until uh, I was about six years old, and they, uh, along with spina bifida and paralysis from the waist down, usually it goes bowel and bladder problems. Uh, reflux of urine and things back into the kidneys and so I had a lot of kidney infections sure and so they tried to do reconstruction of the uh, bladder area and there were two surgeries with that when I was six and seven years old they both basically failed they 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 helped but they basically failed and so I was up in I was in uh, diapers up through this time and even further which I can discuss if you want me to. Uh, but it, uh, so after seven years old, we battled kidney infections on and, on and off back for the next uh, four years. Mm. And when I was 11 years old, they said, we are gonna burn a few bridges. We're gonna do a urostomy, which is similar to a colostomy, but it's a reconstruction for urine sure. excretion rather than uh, feces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they did that when I was 11. Uh, Surgeries again to straighten my feet a little more when I was 13 because I was getting pressure sores on that mm -hmm. and then no more real um, Birth defect related surgeries that I can think of you know just extraneous things having to do with wear and tear over the years Sure, so, so. it all happened kind of teenager and below, you know, below. Mm -hmm. So yes, what ma so what was that like growing up, you know with a disability? Uh, with regard to the need for surgery and, and things like that, it was uh, it was difficult because of the kidney infections. They were painful. Um, you, if you had a kidney infection, you couldn't go out and play with your friends. You know that kind of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to watch that, take lots of pills. Mm -hmm. um, braces to be dealt with because of the uh, birth defect. Uh, I started out with. Uh, and I, I can show them to you if you want me to. I started out with braces all the way up to my under arm, underarms. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was a back brace and two leg braces all tied together. Mm -hmm. And my first crutches were uh, 
crutches that actually went up to here and they were cuff crutches. And uh, first crutch is about that tall. Mm -hmm. From the ta yeah. Oh, from the table up. From yeah. the table up, about yeah. that tall. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they can go up and get them. If they're right up there. <laughs> 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 um, and um, so I had those and progressed through different kind of crutches mostly as I got older. Also progressed to lower braces. Okay. Uh, my back developed fairly well. Uh, with spina bifida, a lot of times scoliosis will set in. I never had that problem. Oh, mm -hmm. Also with spina bifida, hydrocephalus uh, is usually a common occurrence. Hydrocephalus to the point that, and that's water on the brain, I've sure. heard you do that in mm -hmm. some of the other interviews, uh, where the spinal fluid backs up into the uh, brain cavity. And uh, I never really had that. I didn't have to have the hydrocephalus surgery. I found out years later that I do have a hydrocephalic condition that doesn't have to be drained or anything like that. I don't know if it affects my mental capacity or not. <laughs> you know, some people <laughs> say it does from day to day, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, but that was fascinating to discover. And mm -hmm. I just discovered that last year. Interesting. So, uh, <laughs> so that was kind of a long-winded answer to the question. But growing up, uh, gosh, I mean, I could tell you lots of stories growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on both aspects of it, I guess growing up, I was uh, put through normal schools. Mm -hmm. I have two older brothers who are both uh, gifted engineers, and they were uh, nine and ten years older than I am. Oh wow! So, they so it was sort of yeah. Nine, I was nine. I was the huh? It's eight and nine. Eight and nine. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. It's eight and nine, not nine and ten. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and my mother is a school teacher. Was a school teacher. My dad was a poultry farmer who was gifted at building and making things so mm -hmm. he could fix my braces oftentimes. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, and my brothers always uh, always were into different things engineering wise. They liked technology and putting things together. So I, I grew up in a home where uh, I guess I was expected to develop to a full potential. Sure. Uh, and uh, so I was always, you know, watching them doing what they were doing uh, outside the home. Growing up in normal schools was kind of difficult uh, in some ways. I um, don't know that I was ever made fun of, but I guess in in my old age I recognize how I was a little bit isolated from the rest of the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, smell bad sometimes, you know, because I wore diapers till I was 11. Sure, so yeah, because of what you were dealing with. Yeah, with right. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it was... It was interesting growing up in, in public schools. And, mm -hmm. uh, I always uh, did the steps in public schools. Mm -hmm. I learned to fall uh, and walk. Uh, my, the doctor told my mother that he would have me walking by the time I was two. Hmm. And sure enough, he had me on braces and crutches by the time I was two. And um, so I, I always walked with braces and crutches, learned to go up and down the steps when I was six years old. Uh, up until then, uh, the teacher would carry me in and out of the building, so to speak, uh, during fire drills and that type of oh, thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you have to get uh, out of your fast. Kindergarten was a first floor thing, so that was in and out. But first uh -huh. grade, I had to learn to go up and down the steps. Uh -huh. And uh, thereby kind of hangs a tail, too. Uh, so once I learned to go up and down the steps, the teacher still had to carry me in and out because there was no stair rail. Okay. at the front of the building where there was just three steps to deal with but there was no stair rail and I had no real ability at that time to do steps. So, mm -hmm. so did you have any therapy, was it just the doctor that was helping you through this or did you have any like physical therapy or anything yeah. like that? Okay. Yeah, there was lots of physical therapy. Uh, I had, my primary care physician was my GP, okay. you know, pediatrician mm -hmm. and uh, we always called him Uncle Charlie. And uh, I fell one time when I was on the front porch before I learned how to fall and I had a concussion. And he was across town in a rocket, you know, and that, like, just there. Mm -hmm. So he was that kind of guy, nice. hands-on guy. Mm -hmm. Then I had uh, our local uh, center in Harrisonburg, our local area in Harrisonburg, had a lot of kids with different disabilities. We had polio, we had cerebral palsy, got one or two spina bifidas that I recall. And uh, so we had a center for crippled children. The parents had gotten together and funded a physical therapist there. 
Wow. And so we had a physical therapist in Harrisonburg from when I was a tiny child up probably till I was 10 or 12 years old and the thing was integrated into the normal school sure. type environment. So uh -huh. the PT acted in two regards. I had severely clubbed feet mm -hmm. as a child. And so he worked to straighten my feet and then also to teach me to walk in parallel bars and walk on the crutches. Mm -hmm. Who taught you how to fall? You were talking about he that. He did too. Okay. And I remember extremely clearly, very clearly, and, and this PT, by the way, retired eventually as an OBGYN. He went to Richmond, got his OB, uh, got his medical huh. degree, retired. That's a somewhere. diverse education. Yes, he did. He had a very diverse education. <laughs> his name was Harry. And um, he... Uh, I can very well remember him working with me in front of my parents' house. We had a, a bank that came out in front of our house that dropped off just subtly. And so it wasn't a severe drop off. And so he, he said, now, you're just going to fall right here in the grass. Boom. You know, just let yourself go. You know, kind of think grass wasn't going to hurt me. Da, mm -hmm. da, da. And I was short. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just worked with me till I didn't have any fear of falling. Mm -hmm. That's, that's that really the thing. first thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then just taught me, well, no, just let yourself tumble. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Has that ch has that changed as you've gotten older at all? or uh, Changed a little bit with regard to I'm not as, I don't feel myself as stable as I used to be. Sure. So uh, I watch, I'm more f fearful of places that I might fall mm -hmm. than I was before. Plus people make a big deal out of it. Right. You know, it's like. Right. Like it's it's you're you're good you know how to handle it but other people yeah are like, <laughs> exactly yeah. right and it's caused me a lot more trouble since I've been an older person mm -hmm. so several times when I was younger went and made presentations to some of the kids in the local schools you know sure. and uh, I always used to tell them that I have spine bifida it's a condition that's not going to get any worse or any better not true old age sets in mm -hmm. so that's another disability all to in itself yeah. the spina bifida i guess is not any worse mm -hmm. per se sure. i was correct there mm -hmm. but now i'm old so as you you know kind of were growing up and then it was time to drive uh -huh. driving so what was that like you know getting your license and then kind of now how you drive well uh i drive with hand controls just mm -hmm. to to let you know so you can sort of get that in your mind mm -hmm. i couldn't wait to learn to drive right everybody couldn't wait to Mm -hmm. um, and so it was required at the time and is required again that you get your behind the wheel training at uh, a center. In our case, it's Woodrow Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wilson Workforce Center, now they call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went up, my grandmother would come and pick me up from school every Thursday and drive me up uh, from Harrisonburg to uh, Fishersville to uh, do the behind the wheel training until I was ready to get my driver's license. And then, uh, like every kid, when I got my driver's license, I had my dings and my, I had one major wreck that wasn't my fault, thank goodness. <laughs> but I did manage to ding my father's car on a lot of different things, like the rail at the bank and you know that kind of thing. But I never, thank goodness, I never was involved in something that was, was my fault. But I got to feel very competent. And in fact, Driving has made my freedom because yeah. if I didn't have it, I couldn't have gone very well to college, especially uh, the college, the University of Virginia where I went to was not accessible at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was extremely difficult to do without a car. And there's a few tales to go with that mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. so. And he, he is a very good driver. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, dear. <laughs> I said, I, uh, especially, you know, high traffic. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. He's he's very calm and you know, very sensible about that, whereas, you know, I can't stand it. So right. I, you know, capitulate to him. You know. You're you're thankful that yeah. he's yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 No, I'm the same the same with Scott. Yeah, he um, he's he's definitely the the driver of the family. If we're going to DC or Richmond or something like yeah. that, like He's he's the one that's driving, and I'm trying to stay awake in the passenger seat. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. so do you have um, a, a vehicle wise now? What do you have a van? Um, is there a ramp in it? What is your what does your vehicle look like now? We just recently purchased a, a used van with a lift in the back, so I can bring okay. my a normal wheelchair with me because uh, I use a wheelchair more now for distance walking. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm older. I'm overweight and that kind of thing and shoulders are starting to fail and so mm -hmm. I, I use it for a longer longer distance 
And so we have that. We have uh, a little little vehicle, four cylinder, that I can actually get my regular wheelchair in. Okay. Uh, take the wheels off and just pop it in, then I can still do that. And but I have to in both those situations primarily use braces and crutches with it. I can crawl through the back of the van without my braces on. Nice. Uh, but it's sort of a pain sure. you know, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I use that combination. And then we've got a, a Jeep uh, Cherokee that, that we drive around in the snow if we need to. But that, right. it's not as much fun driving around in the snow as right. it used to be. As it used to be. <laughs> but if you have to get somewhere, it'll yeah. do it. It works. It, it works. works. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about um, your home growing up. Did you did your family have to make any um, modifications to your home? Anything um, to make it easier for you to get around? Well, yeah, probably two two modifications that I can think of. Adding stair rails to the outside steps because mm -hmm. uh, the inside I learned to go up and down. Because my bedroom, we lived in a two two bedroom. Uh, two I mean two bed two story. Thank you, dear. Two story. Uh, uh, Colonial house with a shed dormer on the back, mm -hmm. and uh, all the bedrooms. Were all the bedrooms were upstairs. Sure. And mom and dad used to carry me up and down the steps until I was about again seven or eight years old, and mm -hmm. I still remember the Sunday morning where you know I'd been working on going down. And of course, daddy really knew about it, but I thought he did. And mom said, "We're gonna go down to breakfast, and and you're gonna be down there, and daddy's not gonna know. You know? Uh, He's gonna go get you surprising. out of bed. You're not gonna be there." <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so. They, yes, they did. They had to make the stair rails on the house uh, outside. And uh, when I had my feet straightened in the eighth grade, mm -hmm. Daddy built a, a nice long ramp out the back because I lived the whole summer in a wheelchair. Okay. While you were healing. While I was healing. Sure. And then homes that you've had throughout the years, what have you done to... Because I guess as you're older now, are you using your ch like chair and crutches kind of back and forth? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, up until this house... We never made any modifications, did we? And they were the the house we lived in before this one was built as a retirement home, and I think the the lady was already in a wheelchair, so it was kind of yeah, you know, it was a one open, story open sure. plan, mm -hmm. and um, you know everything on on one floor mm -hmm. uh, kind of a thing, and so that was good. And this one we. Uh, We've had we had to even up the floor. This is an old farmhouse, and we built a hundred years ago, and uh, yeah. and in various stages. And so, when we first moved in, like the floors throughout here, we either had a really wide threshold, or there was a little step up or step down into each room, you know, like an inch or so. And so, oh, yeah. uh, so we had the floors uh, leveled out and made it uh, a little bit easier for him to use the. Chair. I, yeah, I stick with a chair mostly. Pull oh, beside you. Yeah, that's it. It's so, so I use this. I use you a can chair. Spin around. I can <laughs> Is he still around. in? Yeah, he's in. Now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> If I'm doing stuff you don't want me to do, <laughs> tell me, will you? Yeah, yeah, you can dance and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but yes, this is um, a, it's a very handy chair to have for him because it doesn't require that doors be wider or sure. anything like that. Because it, it's skinnier. It's yeah. skinnier. It's yeah. body wide. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like we can take that to hotels. And so even nice. if we don't have a handicapped accessible room, he can still move around in the room yeah. without... You know, so if you're absolutely system. desperate for, you know, being the hotel says, I don't have... Well, then, okay, mm -hmm. you got to bring the chair with you. But we don't always bring it with us. If you could make any changes to your home to make it, um, I guess function better or, I mean, it seems like your home functions for you pretty well. Um, is there anything that you would um, do differently? Well, we originally talked about that question when you asked about it, we said, yeah, we'd move. But, <laughs> <laughs> but since that's not an option at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, I, we have, it, there is an upstairs to this house and it is a big house. and. Um, I would like to be able to get upstairs a lot easier than I do now because mm -hmm. uh, I can do two things. I can either go up the steps on my crutches, which is getting harder and harder, or I can scoot up the steps on my butt, mm -hmm. which is not getting easier. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like to have is a little elevator in the house. That'd be so neat. Yeah. Uh, expensive, but neat. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'd like to have that. I, what else would we do to this house? I don't know that we'd do anything else. The basement's available to do the same thing. And there's access to both the basement and the house from 
Go around a little bit. Yeah. So you can that's come in on that. So you don't have to like go downstairs yeah. to get to the basement. Right. You can yeah. go, go outside. Go outside. outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is the only problem underneath is what yeah. it's bad, But, but we never talked about uh, maybe a uh, bigger bathroom. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because when we we did remodel the bathroom and did the shower stall kind of thing, because we did not have a shower. In okay. And she likes a shower, and so do I. I mean, and I'm, so it was a tub know. before. Or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, but wish we had you know still still had the tub he likes, I like the he tub. likes mm -hmm. the tub bath mm -hmm. and uh, so if when we redid it although we would still have probably moved it you know because to put the shower we would have had to have moved everything around anyway mm -hmm. but yeah you know, looking back we would have left it with a tub and had a tub and shower because the only really true wheelchair accessibility to that bathroom is this little chair right i mean i can take a regular rolling wheelchair and move it in there sideways but mm -hmm. it's too it's much tight. stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your, yeah and your power chair you can, and my power you can chair we, i can get my power chair in but i put too many dings on the wall we've had to fix too many dings yeah. on the wall <laughs> oh we understand it's that not loud yeah. anymore yeah. <laughs> yeah that and you know between that and the skinned up baseboards and skid marks on the floor and you know yeah it's all that. Yeah, no, we, no. we 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 have, have, have a problem right. with that too. Huh? <laughs> no, we we often joke that you know we try the magic eraser as much as we can, and then mm -hmm. the drywall's missing, and you have to get some spackle. Oh, well, with me, it's <laughs> drywall missing. Yeah, great, yeah. great, great hunks, great hunks of drywall yeah. missing. You know, so yeah, we can't we, just ding it. He's got to go all the way along the wall. <laughs> we, I think the aging of our society is going to help. Is is significantly helping all of that? You know, mm -hmm. because because mm -hmm. people learning to deal with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. because yeah, people you know, are going to want to stay in their homes, you know, and they do, if they do that, if they want to stay there, then they've got to put grab bars and, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and when we redid the bathroom, he was sort of, I mean, this had been a few years ago, and he was kind of anti some things and everything. And so I used the excuse, you know, well, oh, I'll need them. <laughs> and oh my gosh, I'm so glad we have them oh, now. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Because just, just different things, and I think, you know, man, this makes life a lot easier for me, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Laundry, is laundry easy for you to get to? Uh, it's easy for me. Uh, it's in our does, utility Because he doesn't room. do it. Because I don't do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I don't do it. But I will tell you this, though, in, in somewhat in pride of, of living independently as well. Uh, when I had my first house, that was a concern because the laundry was downstairs. Mm -hmm. And so I just packed it all up in a duffel bag and threw it downstairs yeah, and it would throw it downstairs bringing it up was another task altogether but sure. you could do that in your teeth right you, know, you just grab it by your teeth and so you just found ways to, to, to make it work to it, yeah to make it work. so i know this wasn't one of the the questions but i was curious you talked about going to school at uva mm -hmm. um what was difficult about the campus because i know um scott has talked in his interview about how jmu was difficult when he was back in there but UVA, what was what was hard about getting around? The different the the thing about the campus. First off, there were no ADA uh, modifications had been made because it was for AD. It was before AD. It was sure. nineteen seventy two through seventy seven. Sure. Uh, so there were steps everywhere to go to, which I negotiated mm -hmm. quite well. Uh, the pain of it all was that in order to make things relatively expedient. We per had to purchase two reserved parking spots, one near the engineering school and one near my dorm. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to even purchase a uh, reserved parking spot at the at the uh, cafeteria area. I'm probably going to be telling things about UVA that they don't <laughs> want to. I just thought about that. Oh, well. Anyway. But, They're past. But the, yeah. well, the, the, the director of parking and transit, I said, what am I going to do about uh, dinner and he says park in a service area get a ticket and bring it to me and I'll tear it up so for the first couple of months I was there I had a ticket practically every day and I had to drive down parking and transit sometime that week and get him to tear them all up you know and it, and it was a real pain in the you know what and mm -hmm. so um, but finally after a couple of weeks I guess the you know, little university cop just said I must know somebody. I'm going to stop writing tickets, <laughs> right. and so they did. And huh. he wouldn't give me a service sticker for the car. Huh. You know, he said, "Now you can't have one of those because you might be parking somewhere else that you shouldn't." Yeah. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Because so, there were no handicapped right. parking spots. Sure. And so we had to pay for that. But the other thing that was probably difficult, no, I'd say those were, that was the bottom line. Uh, the parking situation and, uh, but now if I'd had to negotiate it, I knew, I knew a gentleman who did have to negotiate in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And I think they gave him permission to live off campus in his own you know, he didn't have to live in a dorm because first year, first and second year students were uh, encouraged to live in the dorms, especially sure. first year. Mm -hmm. I saw him drag his chair up Cabin Hall steps. Wow. Mm -hmm. Behind him. And I was on one of the first architectural review boards for the university mm -hmm. uh, to say, hey, what do we need to do to make this? In 76, they put that board together. So what do we need to do to make this campus? The grounds acceptable, mm -hmm. accessible. So. Yeah, no, and I, because that was my next next question was if you couldn't get up, you know, the stairs with your, you know, crutches, like, how it would have been nearly impossible to yeah. negotiate with in a chair. Oh yeah, it yeah. would have been absolutely, and there were no accessible bathrooms that I recall, because I, don't, yeah, I don't think I ever put myself in a situation where I had to use an accessible. Yeah, or, right. Well, it, it's interesting because the gentleman who kind of t coined the term, uh, his name is Ron Mace, so he co coined the term universal design. He went to school and kind of experienced some of the same changes or oh. things you did. So this is pre-ADA or yeah, pre-ADA. And so he thought, you know, why, why does it have to be like this? You know, like yeah. it, it can be, it can be different. And so um, he started kind of the universal um, design movement um, through his experience of trying to go to school. So, yeah. but you've kind of seen it both sides, pre-ADA mm -hmm. and post-ADA. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I guess I do remember, I mean, I'm not ashamed or afraid to get on the floor and scoot somewhere mm -hmm. if I have mm -hmm. to. Um, one of the things that I used to do also that was difficult there was getting in the showers. There In the dorms, there were group showers at one end of each suite of rooms. Mm -hmm. And so what I used to do in that process was I used to take a little stool about that wide and about that tall, and I used to put a towel across my lap and put the stool on my lap and go from my room to the shower and um, put the stool in the shower and get on it, take my shower, and do the reverse process, which was kind of a pain in the neck. Yeah. And that kept me, by the way, uh, I did have an opportunity to live on a lawn room. Mm. Oh. But yeah. the lawn rooms, I don't, I don't guess the lawn rooms to this day are still accessible because mm -hmm. they are historic uh, mm -hmm. to the thing. So um, it didn't because of the university's decision. Mm -hmm. I just made the decision on my own that I would not ask for the opportunity, because I had an opportunity to live in a, sure. in a room. Because mm -hmm. the showers and the bathrooms uh, for mm -hmm. any, miles away. are miles away. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they, they, they would, not in that room. Right? They're not in that <laughs> yeah. room, and they're not even on the lawn. You have to go down the steps mm -hmm. and back up to a shower room and a bathroom and so on and so forth. So you right. better have to be in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and on a cold day, I knew a lot of people who were in a hurry for a shower to get down there. So, sure, so, exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, how did you all meet? What's your story? Why don't you tell it, since I've done all the talking. It seems unfair. <laughs> well, we met through a dating service. Oh, and this is pre the computer online dating, really. I mean, computers had been invented by then, but they, they weren't used for, for such trivial things. It's still as big as this house. <laughs> the computers were. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. As as he, was, he was living and working in Lynchburg, and I was living and working in uh, my home area in West Virginia. And, uh, uh, you know, there's an ad in the paper for this thing, and I said to the other teacher that I carpooled with, I said, uh, I said, I, uh, I am halfway tempted to try that. She said, oh yeah, do it, do it, do it, knowing she wouldn't do it, but she wanted me she to wanted do it. She wanted somebody else to try it. Right, she wanted somebody else to try it. <laughs> and so he kind of did the same thing, and it was a, or he was complaining at work that he didn't have anybody to date or what all this kind of stuff. And his boss said, well, have you tried a dating service? And went to the phone book and you know, When your boss says try a dating service, you go. <laughs> yeah, so. That's funny. So, um, anyway, we, uh, uh, went with this service, uh, you know, you filled out a questionnaire and so forth and so on, and, um, 
paid your fee, and whenever they matched you with anybody, all you got was a name, address, and telephone number. There was nothing, no other Picture, information. Nothing. No Picture, nothing, no nothing, nothing. description, no, mm -hmm. nothing. nothing. And uh, so he, he called uh, one night and... Um, she hung up. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I, I had another guest that night, you know, I said it was a guy I'd been dating and who was a real pain. And uh, there's a reason I was trying to take it because it was going nowhere. Right. And uh, and so I said, uh, well, yeah. I said, well, I said I've got company right now. I said, can you uh, can you call back later and everything. And so I hung up, and I thought, well, you know, it's the last time I'm ever going to hear from him. But you know, an hour or so later, he he called again and. As we say, it was downhill from there. Downhill from there. We we had phone conversations over the period of a month, and uh, and then he said, "Well, I'd, you know, I'd like to to meet you, get together." And so I said, "Okay." And I was living in this you know very small town in in West Virginia. Where can I, can I interrupt real to... quick? Sure. So this is a God thing. Mm -hmm. Because when I, in the dating service, you had a chance to say how far away a person you'd like to meet. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask for no more than a 45 minute distance, which was uh, Roanoke right. circumference. Yeah. And I got her name two and a half hours away over a road that made 33 <laughs> look like, an old 33 look like uh, an interstate. Interesting. So, yeah. so that's the first guy yeah. thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so um he, you know, and he had said from the, in the very first phone call, you know, he said, I was born with, with spina bifida mm -hmm. and, you know, explained a little bit about that. And I thought, oh, yeah, I've seen the March of Dimes telephones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, you know, my, my initial thought in my brain was, well, I don't have to marry him, you know. And uh, so when he just, when he decided to come over to visit and meet, um, I told him, uh, you know, gave him directions, and I said, "You'll come up." To a phone booth. I said, "Yes, yeah, this is how long ago it was." I said, "There's a phone booth right beside the courthouse," and I said, "My house is kind of hard to find, or my place is kind of hard to find." I said, "So you call me from that phone booth, and then I'll walk over and get you." Yeah, this is pre cell phone. Yes, oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. This is, yeah. is nineteen eighty two. Only yeah. only AT and T Bell Labs had yeah. thought of cell yeah. phones, but and uh, <laughs> so. So my reasoning with that was, you know, he would call, and then I would walk over, and we we had no idea what each other looked like, you know, mm -hmm. and so, but in this small town, I mean, I knew everybody, so if I saw somebody I didn't know, well, it's gonna be him. Sure. But I thought, you know, I will walk over there, and if it's really bad, <laughs> I'll just <laughs> make the turn and keep going, you know, just go back home. Uh, but uh, but it wasn't bad, obviously, and. Uh, <laughs> So that was the 30th of October in 1982, and nine months to the day later we got married. Awesome. So yeah. it was pretty quick. It was very quick, yeah. That's awesome. And, yeah, but we were, you know, we weren't we, like we talked 16. On the phone. And, and yeah, we both been, I was 29 and she was 27. By the time we got 20, married. 26, I guess. No, I was 27 by the time Yeah, but, any, but, but the point was that the, the dating service really knew what they're doing. I didn't know whether they were doing Myers Briggs or what. But, sure. But we sort of figured that we were the other half of each other's brain. Hmm. And so we really liked each other, at least on the phone. You know? Right. In conversation. In yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. keep ourselves busy. Then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, cool. So. That's a neat story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. So how has this impacted how you do things in the community for leisure, recreation, um, social activities? That That's sort of funny. I, I was raised in a time when... Uh, if you had a disability, there, even though we had a center for children, there really wasn't a lot of things to do socially. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that I went to normal public schools meant that I wanted to do a lot of things that the kids did. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't play football if right. you weren't fast enough. But I could figure out a way to play baseball. And the way we played baseball, you know, I could sit on the ground and catch something that somebody came to me and I could and I had a pretty good pitch arm. I could throw it. But the way I, I batted was I always batted with one hand and somebody else ran for me. Okay. And and the kids never minded doing that. The problem I recognize now is is that you never got to play in official things like Little League and stuff like that because they weren't gonna make the accommodations for you to do that. Whereas nowadays they would put those together. Mm -hmm. 
my dad was a big fishing guy and I liked to fish but again it was a real pain to take me fishing so as the years kind of went by I lost interest in a lot of the those social things they used to do until Big Brothers Big Sisters came on mm. and uh, <coughs> excuse me I signed up to be big at the encouragement of one of my uh, workplace associates and this child expected to do a lot of the things that a big was supposed to do and one of those was to go camping oh. now the advantage of being an adult with a job that's a good paying job mm -hmm. is that now you can afford to do you could go out and buy the technology and buy the things that allowed you to Participate. work around your disability mm -hmm. and and work with that so so bj and i would go camping and uh i have you know we go bowling and and things like that and uh, uh, I've enjoyed those things I don't have the driving interest in the sports and the, some of those things sure. though, that a lot of the adults do now mm -hmm. it's just that way mm -hmm. but but I, I was very grateful for that to make me realize hey this is something that I couldn't do as a kid but I can now because I have a good job and I have uh, have the wherewithal to go and do some of this. Yeah. So what is one thing in your community that you would want to change to make it easier for you to participate in things that you enjoy? Um, one of the things that Becky and I, have, uh, that I constantly complain about, when you go out to dinner, the accessibility of restaurants in the community is still terrible as far as I'm concerned. There, there's a lot of new ones that are good and that type of thing. Uh, exceptions are floors. And cleanliness of floors especially in the bathrooms um, they are very slick with crutches and I don't when I go to a restaurant I don't have to take my wheelchair all the time sure. and I want to get along on my crutches and so I would wish I wish they do things different there are some restaurants that you know change things the way they do it the community as a whole I pump my own gas which most everybody does nowadays and that's not a problem um, if they were going to build a new building, I wish they'd ask me to consult or somebody to consult, like Universal Design, like mm -hmm. your company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're here, you're available, you're a resource. I'm a resource, and they may not want to do it the way, or somebody else may not mm -hmm. want it that way. But you need that perspective. Right, right. So there's the codes, and then there's people living yeah. in the world. There's, there's, reality. Reality. there's yes. the codes and reality. Yeah. That's exactly Doing right. Now I have a friend that uses forearm crutches due to an amputation and she always complains like in the bathrooms that um, they put the, um, you wash your hands and then they put the towels way far away and yeah. she, she struggles because she's like, okay, well, I have to wipe them on my hand, my wipe my hands on my yeah. pants just to, to be able to yeah. get to the towels yeah. to, so there are little things that she... Well, you get water on the floor from just not worrying about water, washing and drying your hands on your pants, and there's the water to slip on. You know? the, the, right, yeah. exactly. But greasy floors are the worst. The, the fast food restaurants around, and, and I empathize with them. I mean, I'm sure it's difficult to get that film off the floor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they're just not conscious of how well they do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the floors is... Well, we say very, you know, smooth anyway. Yeah, they're smooth anyway. Too. And you know, if, or if they've got a little bit of texture to them, you know, it's not as, not quite as bad. Do you have any advice for people who are interacting with you for the first time? They have questions. They might be curious about you. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I always call, especially when I'm on my crutches. Uh, I generate what I call the Kramer effect. I don't know if you remember the TV show Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember how Kramer would go like that? Right. You yeah. can see it in people's <laughs> faces when they see you for the first time, or especially when they're close to you. you know? And you come around. Um, I, I wish people would understand that I've been doing this, first of all, for 61 years, since I was two years old. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I make mistakes, and I screw up now and again, uh, big time sometimes. Uh, so I wish people would first off uh, respect that fact. The second thing is that I wish they would ask questions and say, you know, don't start going and doing the Kramer effect of moving things and doing all this and doing this and let me help you and and da 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 da. Uh, ask me first, you know, ask me who I am. Ask, 
two two incidents I'd like to cite. So sure. People allow me. Yeah, go for it. One of them was one of them was a, a long ago incident that Becky and I used to go to the automobile races, uh, Martinsville and so on uh -huh. and so forth. And uh, I think this was at Martinsville, but it might have been down in North Carolina with her sister and brother-in-law. And I'm going down concrete steps, and this was when I could even do concrete steps without a rail, which was a real trick. But I fell. You know, which of course generated the usual, which people can't help it. You know, yeah, somebody falls, anybody falls. But then two guys came in and they grabbed me by the arms and started standing me up. And I'm going, wait a minute, guys, wait a minute, let me go. Because my arms are what I use to get myself up. Right. So I wish people would, when they want to offer help, ask me, may I offer help? Respect the, respect the de declination if it is given. Mm -hmm. And then... How can I help? Sure. Not decide for themselves how to help. That was the first story. Second story just happened to me at Christmas time. I went shopping over at Stonefield in Charlottesville and I had my van and I'm unloading the wheelchair. And I don't know what I said to this lady, but I really made her mad. <laughs> she comes up to me and she says, let me help you with that. And I said, no ma'am, I'm said, I'm fine. And she said, oh, come on, let me help you. And so, as Becky says, maybe I'm a little smart eloquent or something. But I said, okay, you want to push a button? Because that's all you need to do with the van is push a button and everything comes out. You just get the wheelchair and go. And she said, well, that's not a very nice thing to say. And she walked off in the nastiest huff I have ever seen in my life. You know, it's like, I, she must have misunderstood me. It's the only thing I can say. I hope she sees this video to, to say that. I'm sorry, lady. I didn't really. To, to, that's all that needed to be done. That's yeah, all that needed to push the button. That's what you do. You want to tell them about, uh, about helping you, though? Or it's kind of interesting about the kinds of help you get. Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's I fine. said that. A few years ago when he had shoulder surgery um, and uh, the first time you know which was somewhat of a learning experience you know for us both anyway mm -hmm. but he had a his power chair I mean, as we called it the contraption up on top of it which was basically a winch that would you know hoist him up and you know it could spin around he could get on the toilet and this this and that and the other sure. mm -hmm. but Getting all that accoutrements out of the van, and you know, in fact, that time we didn't even have the van. We had um, just had jeeps and stuff, and so you know, we're rolling them down these little ramps and all this kind oh, of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, I had it in my brain how I could how to do it and all that kind of thing. And I always laughed because the only people that ever offered to help, help. Yeah, that offered that. to help me, were other women whom, you know. I said, they were no stronger than you. Well, they were no stronger than me, and plus they didn't even know what they, what were, they were doing, doing. Mm -hmm. you know, or like eighty-year-old guys, you know, <laughs> which That's I, my same experience yeah, too. That's which fun. you know, which I, you know, it's always so sweet and everything. You know, thank you so much, but you know, and here's these big strapping guys walking past, and you know, not even giving a second look, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, but I said many times, you know, I said as Chris says, I don't really need help. I've got you know, or he doesn't Give need to help. You know, just yeah, just mm -hmm. just give me time and just let we'll just deal with it and 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 that kind of thing. Um, but you know, I said I, I appreciate it, but I'd always laugh because I said you know the ones who would ask to help you know would I'd probably have to pick them up right. later you know <laughs> after they've so, been helping you yeah, yeah. So, so well yeah that. and it's true because you have your system right you you do it so much mm -hmm. you have your system and if somebody you know I know when I tried to help him before when he was taking his chair apart to put it in the car like. I'd, I'd mess it up because you know mm -hmm. I would make it you know go even longer because mm -hmm. he had his his way mm -hmm. of doing it and so like and I would try to do it you know when it's raining or something yeah. you know let's, yeah. let's get it done fast no that, that, yeah. that, that, I was, it, that it doesn't work it doesn't no mm -hmm. that really long longer thing is a big factor too I wish mm -hmm. people had more patience for mm -hmm. because I mean I like to say about myself and I think it's true with anybody with a significant disability we're God's little tribute to Rube Goldberg you know, Rube Goldberg was the for for people who aren't familiar with was the the mousetrap game was, oh, yes, was based yes. on Rube Goldberg ideas where you go through you go around Robin Hood's barn to try to figure out how to just move from here to here. Very true. And it's mm -hmm. true with a disability because of the fact that you can't just go from here to here with a disability. Mm -hmm. So it takes time, it takes 
it, it, to be safe, it takes patience and it takes a certain way of doing. Mm -hmm. And so I wish people understood that too. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a that's a very good visual and very true for people that that do it every day and mm -hmm. see exactly what they have to do yeah. to get from one point to another. Becky yeah. even realizes that we were talking this morning. That you said you didn't realize when you got married how long things were going to take. Yeah. Well, and then but then you know, and then I said uh, you know also I'll turn around and I'll think oh well, this is going to take him forever you know, and all of a sudden Poof, you know he's done and it's like mm -hmm. you know how do you do that? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, he's got tricks. Yeah. I got tricks. Yeah. <laughs> I got tricks. <laughs> and as we said, just because. He makes it look easy doesn't mean it is easy. Yeah, just because right. we make it look easy doesn't mean it looks easy. Well, yeah, easy. and how long, so. has, you know, how long has it taken you to get to the point where you've made it look easy and all the you know exactly. things that you've tried? Um, that didn't work you know, or exactly. that caused, yes, that's a good point. That's yeah. a very good point. And I, Makes you sense. know, and getting back to the, you know, to the people, you know, freaking out you know, over him or whatever. Um, is at, at church, you know, we have readers, you know, do the scripture oh, and all man. that kind of thing. And <laughs> she's made me stop doing yeah. this, which yeah, he, upsets he, me a little bit, yeah, but I guess it's he, sort of, uh, you know, God, respect you know, to God. People, I shouldn't do it. people, a lot of people read and then they just come down the steps by the to the front of the yeah, altar, and come down to the, the altar, and, you know, and, and come down and sit down in the pews. And after a few times, I told him, I said, just sit up there because I said, Nobody's going to be listening to the preacher or anything else going on if you're trying to get down the steps because they're all just, you know, just on their edge of their seat because he, you know, will come down like two or three steps at a time and just, you know, it's, they just figure he's going to wipe out. And Especially if I spread all myself all over the floor. And it's, I mean, it, she's right. It's yeah. really, it's really making a show of me and not yeah. paying attention to God like it should be doing. Yeah, so, so I do. I just stay up there now yeah, and, and not do anything. Yeah. I understand that. At one time we were at church and um, he had gotten, he was, we were coming around the, the curve to, to kind of get to where we normally sit and his pants got caught on oh, the, val the valve of his, um, of his chair. And I, here I am, I'm just walking to our seat and all I hear, I hear, Sarah! <laughs> I'm stuck! <laughs> and here he is, at, he, mm. like, he's already fallen forward, he already has, oh, he already has his hand on the ground, and it's oh, at that no. point where he, the chair, the chair's yeah. almost ready to flip yeah. out, flip out from so behind. So you're right on that edge, if she doesn't come help, you're gone. <laughs> yeah, and so I went up, and I, like, rushed back, and, you know, I got underneath him, and I plopped him back up, and I fixed him up, and then we just went back and sat down. And I think the only people that saw us were the people up on the, you know, on the front. Yeah. yeah. Like, like the, the choir. The choir and yeah. the pastor or whatever. And I'm sitting there thinking, we just <laughs> avoided oh, <laughs> no. a messy yeah. situation. Yeah. You know, people screaming, hollering, all right. that stuff. No. Yeah, but yeah. it does, I mean, it happens so quick, too, and you yeah. just... But are you willing to admit you're exceptionally proud when you pull something yes. like that off? Because yes. I am. <laughs> yes. Oh, very true. I mean, I, I did. I was, I was, you know, sweating a little because mm -hmm. I was like, whoo. But then I'm like, look how we, like, we just, yeah. you know, just... could make it happen. We just kind of pushed him back up. and It works yeah. when you know what you're doing. That's true. That's true. I agree with you on that one. I love that. I just think that's so great. <laughs> and, that's, and that's kind of your own little pride is, is a disability because... Because you do, you, you can in some instances make it look easy. And, and uh, it's like I tell people sometimes, just because I look like I'm in an awkward position doesn't necessarily mean I'm in an awkward position. Sure, but, sure. But yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it's a testament to, you know, how, how you've learned how to do things. Yes, um, exactly. And then, but people in the same right, people still don't understand how hard life is sometimes yes. because just, you've, you've... Just being. Right, because yeah. you've figured it out and what you have to go through to, to do what you want to do. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, you, you might want to eliminate this from the video. I don't know, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. You know, there's times when the Eurosomy pouch will come loose, and you got to deal with that at work. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to, you, you don't want to drive 60 miles to change wet clothes, so you're trying to kind of mm -hmm. kind of hide that a little bit, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. um, it's a trick. It is. It mm -hmm. really is a trick to deal with, with uh, especially personal bathroom issues are a real trick. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, there's there's so many things even out on the Internet of, you know, people just not being able to participate in their community just because of the bathroom. Oh, thing. absolutely. Because and they that can't, is something there, too. Yep, yep, because they can't, yep, they can't find a bathroom, can't get to a bathroom, 
or you know they you know have an issue with you know medical supplies they forgot medical supplies or you know clothes are wet or soiled or whatever yeah. and it it changes your it changes everything yeah, yeah and your ability to participate with other people so and we, and we, and we pretty well had all of those yes all we the proved so yeah. and yeah. everything <laughs> else yeah we yes. pretty well had all those things yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the executive director of our local center for independent living really really gets that because she could go and she'll go make a tour like of a local facility and she'll and they'll and they'll say why do I have people complaining because they can't get here and can't get there and she says look number one the ADA has been around for a whole generation number two we have a generation of people who expect their friends to be there whether they've got disabilities or not Mm -hmm. Aren't you thinking about these things to have like porta potties that are accessible with a wheelchair yep. and and having seats that are and she just comes off of her gut level. Right. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. No, that's super important. I have advocates out there. Like yes. That. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so any advice for businesses or community organizations for making things more welcoming? Uh, the floors was, was the first thing. Mm -hmm. Bathrooms accessible having accessible bathrooms and having your staff even if you're if, even if you uh, even if you don't have your bathrooms as public being aware of, of people with disabilities to yeah go ahead and use our bathroom it's back here da 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 you know uh, and you know you can sort of train and keep an eye out for people who have some of those needs um, again being helpful in their businesses but not forcing help Mm -hmm. Offering help, can I help you? No, no, thank you, I'm fine. Or that kind of thing. Being gracious, I call it being gracious with your help, is mm -hmm. what I call it. Yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. a grace based thing, kind of thing. Um, make, but, and then in a business hiring, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, it's, you know mm -hmm. don't just look at somebody and assume, oh, well, they can't do x y and z because mm -hmm. in all likelihood they can or mm -hmm. they wouldn't be there mm -hmm. um, i've had problems with that yeah. with years. Yeah. about and, and and about yeah. what you can and can't do in the facility mm -hmm. uh that that's a that's a problem and i've never forced the issue because i haven't needed to sure but um yeah. if i needed to I would. but yeah you know i said friends that have, i have known you know longer than him or whatever are still amazed that he has a job. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know? And I said, he graduated from the University of Virginia. You ought to be able to get a job somewhere. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. You have you have the skills. Yeah. You have the mindset. You you yeah. yeah you went to school and you, yeah. yeah yeah the Commonwealth of Virginia said he you know got enough credits and whatnot to graduate. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. you know, and I'd say there's a certain level. And if I if I could teach some of these new kids that come through with spinal cord injuries, there is a certain level of confidence that's required. To portray that skill level because I still I still don't have it in some areas uh, and I think I have missed some opportunities as a result of it uh, but businesses like I've worked for 30 some years as a professional as an engineer and I didn't closer get my to 40. huh closer to, closer to 40 yeah that's true I didn't get my first real experience at travel and work away from the business until I came to this current job that I have with Northrop Grumman and I have a boss who said to me, he said, I need his skill in California. And he came and he asked and he said, you know, how'd you like an opportunity? And, back, and I said, well, I said, let me ask my wife and let me think about it. And we came home and said, yeah, you'll need this, 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 and this because it was three months away. Not just, I've had opportunities, uh, let me yeah. clarify that, I've had opportunities where you where you travel yeah, overnight days, and yeah. maybe for a couple of days, but never a real opportunity where you got to show your stuff and, and, and do that. And this boss at Northrop Grumman gave that to me. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, now that's, that's a testament to yeah, him knowing you and then being willing to make make that effort. Yeah, mm -hmm. and willing to, absolutely yeah. willing to make the effort. Mm -hmm. um, has this impacted relationships in any way? I know you've kind of, it's been your whole life, but... Yeah, girls growing up. <laughs> I'll say that in front of my wife. Yeah. But I, but God gave me a special girl, right. so I won't, I won't right. you know, he did that, you know. He it's, had it all planned out. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, and, and in all fairness, I did go to my own high school prom. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. kind of danced in a weird way, but, and I went with an able-bodied girl. Uh, we never developed much of a relationship out of that. It's, it stopped me from making... Uh, 
true relationships with with some people were were a uh, able-bodied situation was was where the boys get together kind of thing. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now in college that was a little bit different. Because everybody in college, there's, college is one of the great equalizers of people. You know, you might come top of your class, but when you get to the class, you get there, so does everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I wasn't even top of my class when I got there. But, but you make friendships based on the fact that you're all lost together. Yes. You know? <laughs> and true. So you, you, you go and you, and you find out really good friends there. And some people will steer away from you because they don't want to deal with the disability. I remember the first year. I was in a, in a in a dorm room that they put for whatever reason they put three people in a two people room because there wasn't any room but they did it to me oh, wow. and and I still remember my first year roommate he was talking about he said well he said I looked at so and so stuff and I thought well he's a redneck and I looked at <laughs> I looked at your stuff and he said I just forgot that I, I walked out of the room you know and he, he he didn't really want to deal with it too bad but we got along all right so mm -hmm. we just never formed a close friendship. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sometimes all these accoutrements and the way you have to do things just puts people off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just puts people, they mm -hmm. don't want to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the smells and the things that go with disability sometimes, you know, people just, they, they don't want to deal with that either. And so, you know, you're just, that's the way it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That could be hard. Yeah. But then, I guess you do kind of find, you know, real true friends out of yes. that too. Um, people mm -hmm. that really do care and want to get to know you and, you know. And that's nice when you find those men, mm -hmm. really good. I could, mm -hmm. I could, mm -hmm. I could name a couple right now, especially in college. That second year he came back and this one guy, John, was, hey, Chris, it's good to see you. Glad you're staying there. Wow, you know, it's like, hey, John, okay. You know, you're like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, great. great. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I never knew that you were that fond of. You know, our relationship, man, <laughs> he's been a good friend over the years. We've, we've, you know, still friends 30, 40 years later, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, no, those are special relationships. Is there anything that you wish more people knew about you? Uh, yeah, that I'm competent, physically competent at what I do. I may not be, you know, the most competent engineer in the world or the most competent at this or competent at that, but I'm physically competent at what I do. It's hard, I guess, for somebody to recognize that I've been doing it for 61 years, um, which, which I guess probably throws that situation right in there. So that's the first thing I wish. Uh, the second thing I wish that people knew about me, gosh. Curling. Oh, yeah, curl. <laughs> yeah. Got curl. He was in a curling league. Curl. You know, oh, to, yeah. That was another thing that the boss at Northrop Grumman uh, uh, afforded me. He he uh, he he was on a curling team, and he uh, he said, "How'd you like the subs for me?" Okay, wheelchair on ice. Okay, I could deal with that because I'm not going to fall on the ice. That was a lot of fun. That I sounds like, like a movie, wheelchair on ice. Yeah, wheelchair, yeah, wheelchair yeah. on ice. And so, you know, the first day he you know he'd never done it before, and so. That morning he's getting dressed and he said, uh, well, he said, I just hope I don't make a fool of myself. And I said, well, look, I said, you know, you're in a wheelchair on an ice rink playing a game you have never played before. What are the odds? You know? <laughs> that you're going to make a fool of yourself. So, uh, yeah. Did you enjoy it, though? Was it oh, fun? yeah, immensely. I mean, it's, it's a slow game. It's easy to score. And you can take beer out on the ice with you. <laughs> you know? Pro no, or check number one. Like check number one. Okay. Yeah. Beer can go out on the ice yeah, and it falls on the ice. It just freezes you with could, the you ice. Could, yeah, that's right. You drink and play all at the same yeah. time. No, but no, no, no. yeah, it was it was a lot of fun because it really it did take a skill and it was a two two person thing because mm -hmm. I had to have some I really couldn't get enough enough friction on the ice. If you, you think you think no, of course you can't. But if your wheels are cold, the ice is cold. You can get some friction on the yeah. ice. Just not enough to power through it. So you have to have somebody, it's sort of a teamwork thing, kind yeah. of push you know when to let go of the yeah. stone and how to curl it and so on and so forth. So, Sounds neat. Yeah, I had a good time. Back when the civil rights movement was going on, there was a, a, a saying on TV about, you know, when you see a, a black man or woman succeed, your children can look and say, there's somebody that there's an example 
And, and I'd like to, I'd like other people to see that, you know, they have a child with a disability. I, I'd like people to, to say, yeah, there, there goes a guy that succeeded. My kid can do that too. So, yeah, I'd really like, like to add that. And then, uh, now, I have a friend who, who's, uh, who is an electrical engineer as well. She's probably one of the smartest people I ever met. She's a really super person. But her alternate goal in life has become to promote the successes of women. And, and particularly in the technical areas, but in all sorts of areas. She has several books out. One called is, her, is called Her Story, which is really a marvelous book. Uh, but Jill always says that it's, it's about expectations and it's about what people uh, expect of you that drive you to do what you do. Big mm -hmm. brothers, big sisters. My parents and my family who are all, you know, uh, very competent people, they, I'm, I'm where I am today because of their expectations. Mm -hmm. Not just what I wanted to do or just my personal desires, but I'm there because of other people's expectations. Yeah. And, and I always say that I got the gravy years because his, his parents and his family did all the hard work. Mm -hmm. So I, I got the I She got just the gravy. puts up with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the hard work now. Yeah. But no, I think that's a really great point because if, you know, if other people believe in you, like you, you kind of want to want to jump in line and say like, oh, well, maybe I can do this. Yes. I mean, that's, that's a huge encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you know, other people don't believe in you or don't see that, yeah. then you kind of fall in line to what other, you know, others mm -hmm. think. And you don't, you don't know where that, you don't yeah. have, know that strength can come from. Absolutely. And, and, so. and with, with his, with his folks, I mean, they, and his doctor that, you know, with his brace, you know, doctor and all that, you know, uh, kind of thing. You know, he, he said, you know, the world's not made for you. And especially at that time, it was not made for you. Yeah. And so, you know, but don't treat him any differently than you do your other kids or whatever. And so, you know, you know, he was expected to go to school. He was expected to do well, do his best. Um, you know, he was expected to go to college. He was expected to get a job. Mm -hmm. Just and, like your yeah. other siblings. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, um you know, and like I said, his 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 mother especially, but but both of his parents were you know his biggest advocates. And like I said his father had to put the handrail on the steps at the school. The school didn't and, put it in. Daddy put it in. Yeah, Daddy you, know, and like I said, uh, you know, things like Thank that. Thank goodness he was competent doing yeah. that. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> you know, but you know, like I said it was you know just because you have this disability doesn't mean you get out of you know, <laughs> of growing up and mm -hmm. being a mature adult and, you know, and taking care of yourself, mm -hmm. you know, as best you can. And so. there's two more things I want to say. I don't know how you're running on time. Sure. Uh, no, you're good. Two more things I want to say. Um, I'm feeling a little lost nowadays in a way because of this doctor that she was talking about uh, who, uh, and again, and I call it a God thing. We had a couple of doctors intersect at the right times and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. My mother wrote a book called A Pot of Gold that you can find on it's not sold. It's, it was a public, it was a self-published self -published book, oh. but you can find some on the internet. You know, people took them, put them at auctions or whatever. You, but but there's a couple of stories she tells in there about doctors being in the right place at the right time, certain incidences and that type of thing. This doctor physically got me to where I am today, and he's been dead now for about 10 or 15 mm. years. So, you know, you go to other doctors who are not necessarily brace-oriented or or a crutch or or Because nobody looks like him any these days. Not too right. many people do. You don't see people. And and so you feel a little lost. What do I do? How do, you keep playing with things. You keep mm -hmm. how do I play with it? He would have known how to play with it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that if I'd like people to not view me or my disability as the problem to be solved. I'm not the problem. I'm just me. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So the disability not the problem. You may be the problem. I may be the <laughs> yeah. I may be the problem. Yeah, disability right. is not. The problem. I mean that's true. When I am a problem, explain that. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean it's obvious with my disability what the problem is, and you're going to have to deal with that because you can't fix it, mm -hmm. and you can't tell me how to do that. But uh, too many times, and I, and I guess maybe some of this is growing up as a little brother too. You know, you're seen as the problem, not as just part of life. Mm-hmm. Not as Chris. Not as Chris or not, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. not as Chris. And if I'm a problem because I'm being a jerk, if I'm a problem because I don't know how to do things and I need to go back and get another education, that's fine. Tell me that, but, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't 
don't shun yourself away from me because you see me as the problem with the disability mm -hmm. or that you have to put a rail in or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for telling you're your welcome. story. Thank you and um, for the opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. I really appreciate Chris and Becky's honesty about sharing life's challenges and struggles, even their willingness to talk about bathroom issues, which is often a taboo topic, yet such a struggle for so many people. Their advice and perspectives about the design of homes, community spaces, and activities provides excellent insight in how far we've come in the United States with accessibility laws and access, and how far we still need to go to make communities more welcoming for people affected by disability. Thanks Chris and Becky for sharing your story, and I hope you come back again for more stories with the Universal Design Project.